This video is meant to be a brief introduction to the notion of an interval of real numbers. So here's our familiar number line. We could mark off the integers and we could identify where real numbers go by looking at their decimal expansions and each real number would correspond to a point on this line and this is our good old number line that we've used for many years. To create an interval, what you need is to select n points, let's call them a and b. You take all the numbers between them and then optionally you can include a, b, or both to be a part of your interval. So we definitely want all x for which a is less than x is less than b. But the question is, do you want the endpoints? And accounting for all the possibilities, there are four options. You can either have neither endpoint, both endpoints, or you could include one or the other. And these are the compound inequalities that would go along with each of those choices. So let's take a look at some of these possibilities. Suppose you want all the numbers between a and b and you want to include both endpoints. So graphically we could just draw bold dots here at a and b to indicate clearly that we want a and b to be part of the set. This interval is what we call a closed interval. We could use some notation to describe this interval. Set builder notation is very elaborate, very specific, and it can be used in many other situations besides writing intervals. In this case, set builder notation would look like this. We would use curly braces to mean the set of all x such that, the vertical line indicates such that, you can read it that way when you read it to yourself. And then there's this condition, which in this case is we want x to be greater than or equal to a and less than or equal to b. So there's our set builder notation for this closed interval. There's a much easier notation, interval notation. And in this case, inter interval notation would have us write a comma b with square brackets around the a and the b. And that is meant to indicate this set of numbers from a to b, including the endpoints. So what happens if you don't want the endpoints? So let's pretend like we're going to exclude both endpoints. So you draw circles around A and B to indicate that you actually don't want those. You want everything running up to but not including those points. So this is how you would graphically represent an, what we call open interval. So you can think of closed intervals as sort of having the caps closed at the end of the interval and the open means they've, they've come open. Here's the set builder notation for an open interval. And using interval notation, we use round parentheses, which unfortunately looks a little bit like the point A comma B in the plane, but you should be able to judge from context whether you mean a point A comma B in the plane or an open interval from A to B on the real number line. But that's the interval notation for an open interval. Now, you could have one inter you could have one endpoint and not the other or switch those roles there on left and right side and and you can mix and match the interval notation for these possibilities as well we would call these semi closed or semi open as you wish and those are your four basic interval types depending on what you do with the endpoints so just remember that when you're using interval notation to include an endpoint, use square braces, and to exclude an endpoint, use round parentheses. In fact, we use these, this notation so often that sometimes we actually call these closed brackets or closed braces, and we call these open brackets or open braces because of the context here with interval notation. Now, what happens when you actually don't want an endpoint on one side? So what if, in set builder notation, we could write all x such that x is greater than or equal to a? So we want all the numbers, including a, and greater than a, and there's no upper bound to this, so we would just run off to infinity. So there's a way to write this in interval notation. We would write a comma infinity with the closed bracket on, on the a to, to include a. And if we did not want to include a, if we want to exclude a, we could use an open bracket around the a. 
Similarly, if you want all the numbers up to and including b, we would write negative infinity to b, and up to but not including b, we would write this in interval notation. So we have these four other types of intervals where one of the endpoints is missing, so to speak. You run off to infinity or negative infinity. Actually, you could run off to infinity in both directions. So we could have the interval from negative infinity to infinity, but we just know that as the set of real numbers. So the set of real numbers is going to be thought of as an interval. Now about infinity, you'll notice that infinity and negative infinity used um, round braces. You'll never see this because infinity is not a number. So you can never include infinity in an interval. So you'll just never see this notation. The only thing you'll see is round braces attached to infinity and negative infinity. Let's talk about subintervals. It's an easy idea. We say i is a subinterval of j if i and j are both intervals and i is a subset of j. So we'll just look at a few examples and I think this notion should be pretty clear. We could start with the interval from negative infinity to 3. And here's an interval, negative 1 to 3, not including 3. That's a subinterval of the original interval. Every element of the yellow interval is an element of the red interval. So it is a subinterval. Here's the closed interval from negative 4 to 2. The closed interval from negative 3 to 0 is a subinterval of that interval. The open interval from 0 to infinity. The closed interval from 1 to infinity is a subinterval of that. And here's some more terminology. Bounded intervals are those first four intervals we encountered. That's where you have a finite number for endpoints at both the left and the right. Unbounded intervals are the ones that run off to negative infinity or infinity or both. So let's use interval notation to discuss some examples. Example A, what is the domain of the function with the formula square root of x plus 1? So to get a handle on this function, we'll just take the graph of uh, you know, y equals square root of x, and we could move this graph to the left one unit, and there's our graph of the function. So it's pretty clear that the domain should be all the numbers from negative 1 to infinity, including negative 1, so we could write our domain using interval notation this way. Example B, what's the domain of the function with formula ln of 5 minus x? So the first thing, one way to solve this, we could recognize that ln of some quantity requires that the quantity be greater than 0. You can't take the logarithm of 0, you can't take the logarithm of a negative number. So we can simply replace that blob with 5 minus x, solve the inequality associated to that. We realize x has to be less than 5, so that's our domain. The domain, written in interval notation, would be the interval from negative infinity to 5, not including 5. And that's a perfectly legitimate way to answer this question, but let's try to emulate example A a little bit and try to understand the graph of G. What we'll do, first of all, is notice that 5 minus x can be written as negative x minus 5. And we're going to do that little bit of preparation to make the analysis of shifting the graph of ln a little easier. So we'll start with the graph of ln. And if you flip it across the y-axis, that's the same as the graph of ln of negative x. And now if you replace the x with x minus 5, you will slide this graph to the right 5 units. And there's our graph of ln of negative x minus 5. But of course, that's the same thing as the original function. In other words, this is the graph of g. And you can see now quite clearly that the domain really should be the set of numbers from negative infinity to 5, not including 5. So we'll end with this example. What's the domain of s defined by this formula? You'll notice that this is precisely the sum of the two previous functions in examples a and b. So we've already done some work. We know that the square root of x plus 1 has domain from negative 1 to infinity. We know that the domain of ln of 5 minus x is 
the set of numbers from negative infinity to 5. And to be in the domain of this sum function s, x needs to be in both of these sets. So this sounds like a job for the intersection, intersection operator. What is the set of points that are in both of these intervals? It would be the set of numbers from negative 1 to 5, negative 1 including negative 1, not including 5. That's just a semi-closed interval, which we could write this way. And so our domain is this interval from negative 1 to 5. And if you use some advanced software to get a nice graph, you'll notice that the graph does reflect the fact that the domain is the semi-closed interval from negative 1 to 5.